but when we started talking to many of these uh, sustainability role models in Scandinavia, they said that we will never outsource our production to India because we will lose control on the supply chain. When we work with local production, we are able to control them very well. If we move the production to India or Asia, we have to keep on flying and generally that is against our philosophy. And that triggered a thought that maybe we can bring a force of good by connecting the businesses in Scandinavia to do their production in India to do this. So we said that through data technologies, we can actually bring almost real-time events to you. Wouldn't that be interesting? Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani and I'm your host, Vedya Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic and environmental practices. Today, we have with us Shamik Ghosh, co-founder and chief executive officer of Trust Trace, platform for product traceability. He joins us from Stockholm, Sweden. Welcome, Shamik. Hi, Vidya. Happy to be here. Most of our regular listeners have heard the statistics about fast fashion and its impact on our climate and our planet. The numbers, they contribute about 4% to the greenhouse gases. Then there's water pollution, farm practices, in case of natural fiber or petroleum products in case of man-made fibers. The list goes on and on. So say I was manufacturing a t-shirt. Walk me through a life of a t-shirt. So t-shirt is still uh, quite a simple product uh, there, but maybe we can just talk about it. So typically in the fashion supply chain, brand typically is working with a direct supplier which in normal jargon is called or in the fashion industry jargon is called tier one supplier then there is a tier two supplier which is supplying the fabric then there's a tier three supplier which is supplying the yarn or dyed yarn or the dyeing process can be at a tier three level or tier two level also Then you will have the raw material coming. And if it is a natural fiber, you will do some sort of a cleaning called ginning and uh, spinning comes after that. So typically a fashion supply chain will have at least tier five to tier six, depending upon what kind of raw materials you are using. And this is for a very, very simple t-shirt. You are going as far as that uh, there. The bill of material for a winter jacket, which is very, very, of course, popular in (laughs) Sweden or Scandinavia, can consist of at least 25 different line items, which can be three different fabrics, padding, down feather, zippers, multiple different kind of buttons. Think about the complexity that you multiply that with so many different line items. And if you want to map it to tier five or tier six of that. And now on top of it that you are adding millions of product which is to be produced and in fashion complexity is much higher because it is a very, very long supply chain. The supply chain for any garment can start as far as Australia, New Zealand can travel via Asia, South Europe and to US also. You're talking about billions of touch points for over throughout the year. Oh, that sounds pretty complex. But why is this traceability really important? You know, why do I care where my fabric? All I want is a good quality of good value product. So I think the word quality is the loaded word there. So what we consider quality has always been, okay, I will get certain quality that is assured to me by the brand and I will get it. But the quality has got a very different connotation impact also on the supply chain. Fashion supply chain, as you rightly mentioned, is known to have a very, very high product environmental footprint, product social footprint and products ethical footprint. Okay, so let's break it down to each of the component, right? So let's go social because most of us, when we think about anything made in some other country, we're like, oh, did they use child labor? That's the first thing that All of us, intuitively, it is jarring. It sounds not okay, unfair labor practice. So let's start about labor practices. So just so that you know, 
all taken together you are typically talking about 585 different attributes it can be that complex but typically a brand covers around 30 to 40 odd attributes across environmental social and ethical aspects of it so social let's dive deeper into that part of it right so it can consist of fair wages are you playing your employees the fair wages or living wages that is the big controversy going on that people should be paid living wages not fair wages then you have got do you allow the people to unionize so that they can at least have a voice uh, for them to protest or say in the decision making across the supply chain you are talking about child labor you are talking about women exploitation fair working conditions and it is broadly around 10 to 15 such parameters that you are talking about in an environment where only the brand knows the tier 1 supplier so there is a lot of neglect that happens at a tier 2 tier 3 and a tier 4 supplier so what is the difference between fair wages and living wage living wage i know based on the cost of living index it's pegged to that but what is the difference between that and fair wages so for example the four co-founders of trust has come from india and i will just maybe take india as a context right indian government would have said that for any laborer or any worker who is working in a factory suppose x dollars or e converted into indian rupees is the fair wage this is a wage that is typically set by the government and typically it is always kept a little bit on the lower side Typically, a fair wage movement change adjustment only happens once in a 10 years. 10 years is a long period. So then you typically are talking about living wages because when you are in a particular town or a city, you know what does it take to survive in that city. For example, Indian government will typically say, suppose 100 rupees per hour is the fair wage in state of Maharashtra. But we know that the wage in Bombay has to be much higher compared to, uh, suppose, uh, another tier 2 city like Nagpur, right? How do you typically adjust to that kind of an aspects of it? That is why NGOs have always been saying that the wages in the supply chain should be set to the living wages rather than the fair wages so that they can have a decent life outside the work hours also. So fair wage is something that is regulated. It's similar to the minimum wages that we have in the United States. That's right. Largely. So let's move to the second part, the ethical part. So ethical part, because a lot of product is also coming from sources from animals. So are you taking care of animal welfare? Are you taking care of uh, their decent well-being aspects of it? So that is the most critical part. But apart from that, also generally the ethics of the business that are you being a good neighbor do you take care of the local communities in that for example in the fashion industry it is quite common people just import cheap labor and get the work done right but that means you are creating a friction in the society so such kind of ethical behavior and there are business ethics setups are there and similar attributes are mentioned there what are the focus that you want to do there now we go on to the third part the environmental impact and that is the past year people have been talking about it more than ever before i feel so environmental in fact has got multiple different facets to it and i think most of the people have been talking about greenhouse gases but i think we should not neglect the other aspects of it like eutrophication like soil erosion like land usage like water intensity or typically the fresh water intensity aspects then chemical usage which has got a significant impact on the local ecosystem there and the impact on the rainforest because rainforest that you lose now even if you think of growing it back it will take 70 years for it to come to at least 50 percent of the diversity that rainforest has so biodiversity is also critical for us to keep in mind when you're talking about environmental so you cannot be unidimensional about being greenhouse gases you have to take ecosystem because what you're destroying is an ecosystem not one dimension of it i want to step back a little bit eutrophication is runoff from the fields from the factories eutrophication is caused because of excessive growth of plant and algal growth due to high amount of nutrients like fertilizers that run from the fields into the water this is such a complex subject you know just even when we started with just a t-shirt, 
and then moved on to a jacket. That's right. How did you get into this? Were you in the fashion industry? Were you in the IT technology area? So we have a very, very, I think, uh, interesting story. It took a big turn. So we are four co-founders. We used to work together in a large Indian IT services company called HCL, billions of dollars in revenue. And we were doing quite well in that uh, setup. We had worked with a lot of automotive industrial companies in their digital transformation journey. And we were working together for almost uh, six years before starting Trust Trace. 2016, as I was finishing my executive MBA, one of the co-founders, Sarva, he actually was working in the UK and he decided to move back to Coimbatore, which is in the southern part of India, very close to a big textile hub called Tirupur there. And we were quite curious to understand because he was doing very well professionally and all. That's why is he moving back? And he said that, hey, we have got a big farm, which is from or three generations back with us and my father is really affected because of the water pollution coming from Tirupur area which is causing them to a lot of soil quality to go down and this is affecting general farming and he has been contesting this for the last few years there so he went back to support it. I should interject when you see the t-shirt with the Made in India tag most likely it's from Tirupur. High probability of it, exactly. Then he said he's going back and that triggered a thought that so two co-founders are based in Sweden, in Stockholm, and the other two co-founders are based in India. So for me and Rishi, who are based in Sweden, we see a significant high awareness about nature and nature belongs to everybody. We should protect the nature, take care of the nature. Whereas we have not seen such responsible practices being followed in India or Asia, largely, right? And that triggered a thought that maybe we can bring a force of good by connecting the businesses in Scandinavia to do their production in India to do this. What sounds very, very simple, but when we started talking to many of these uh, sustainability role models in Scandinavia, they said that we will never outsource our production to India because we will lose control on the supply chain. When we work with local production, we are able to ensure that there is no chemical pollution, there is no water pollution, there is no air pollution kind of thing. We can control them very well. If we move the production to India or Asia, we have to keep on flying and generally that is against our philosophy. So we said that through data technologies, we can actually bring almost real-time events to you. Wouldn't that be interesting? And that is what the journey of Trust Trace started. Uh, We then started building a complete data platform for them about uh, taking care of the factory level metrics, which is to do with social and environmental aspect and also to cover the complete material movement right from the tier 7 to the tier 1. And that is what we call material integrity. So you have enabled buyers in Sweden to source from India, which is three, five thousand miles away, and be assured that what they are getting is what it is. How have you done that? I understand you're using technology, but you need people on the ground, right? First, let's understand what is the challenge that the brands have. So we are a brand-centric platform. We believe the brands are a key actor in this whole fashion and textile world because they have the maximum value capture in terms of profit. They are the face of the whole supply chain to the general public, right? So we target the fashion brands to sell our solution. There is enough infrastructure existing in the fashion world. You have got so many certification bodies, so many standards, so many audit bodies, NGO activists, right? What is not present is at a product level, if you want to know where the product is made, how it is made, who has made it, and what is the general impact of it. It is tremendously difficult for anybody to do that most of the brands are doing that by putting manual effort production controllers who go and ask for certificates and all but as human beings we are not programmed to check at a lot level you typically get 70 certificates most of the brands don't even open more than two certificates on an average though the data is coming in nobody is processing it this whole game The organization of data plays a very, very significant role. 
And the problem that we are solving is that we are organizing that data at a product level because we believe product is the fundamental unit of sustainable transformation. If you want to transform your business, if you want to transform the world, start with one product get that product to be sustainable it being produced in sustainable factories being produced using sustainable raw materials that is the battle one so we then help these brands to know the complete story of the product right from the source to the end garment and then work with the supply chain to improve the maybe the greenhouse gas emission maybe the land usage maybe the water attributes and for that there are various different certifications that they push the supply chain to go so yes it increases the cost of compliance but it is we have to understand for the future proofing of the business and the future proofing of the planet and the people on it i think these capital investments are necessary for them to do so you've taken this very complex problem and taken the data which was most likely available to the businesses and put it in a platform where a single product can be traced from the start to the finish so i will maybe let me break the solution into three simple things right so when a brand starts a journey of traceability or sustainability the first thing they need to do is get their supply chain most fully traceable what do i mean by that is they should know at a product level who is the tier 1 supplier who is the tier 2 supplier who are the tier 3 suppliers and subsequently then you know that in your supply chain there will be certain red flags or the amber zones you then start working with for example if you are sourcing a fabric from asian country you invariably will be using thermal power stations or the electricity produced through thermal power stations which means your carbon footprint is very high how do you incentivize the supplier to move to renewable energy so this data will come and then you ask the supplier hey can you start putting in wind farms can you start using solar panels and all etc etc right it's a journey so this is a second aspect of it so first aspect was value chain mapping then you do the supplier performance improvement and finally there is a lot of falsification of data happening you are dealing with sustainable materials if you are having organic cotton there is six times the amount of the organic cotton claimed in a year than produced yes there was this big scandal about gods exactly which is a german company was certifying through subcontractors at the farm level exactly so when that happens in our platform you are able to create a digital chain of custody for the factories they have to record the input raw materials in production what is the wastage what is the output that you have produced in the platform it is not full proof but the probability for them to cheat reduces significantly because in the platform now i am bringing like in the platform we have got 40 brands using our platform and over 8000 suppliers spread across 75 different countries and covering almost 26000 factories as of now now if one factory has done a cheating and if we our system is able to detect it the red flag is visible to all the brands and that is a very very big deterrent for most of the suppliers in case they are going towards falsification of data so these suppliers they are shared between brands or that information about the red flag is shared between the brands who are on your portal it's like say you have a google review but in this closed environment so we use a bunch of best of breed solutions to achieve that we are also gdpr compliant which is this european data privacy law there which means all the data is owned by the suppliers as they input their data on their behalf but if the same supplier used by two different brands a supplier will say use my same profile to share the information to them and let us also understand we are a great force for many of the suppliers to be able to be visible to the right brands i was wondering like do you have a supplier preferred list you know which will elevate these suppliers who want to comply want to be sustainable to have access to the brands that you serve so we do something called uh, using certain industry standard principles we do a sustainability rating 
one star to five star five star being the best and also we do the supplier rating we also provide a lot of granular details about a supplier like what kind of machinery they have what kind of value processes they deal with what kind of certificates they have so if a supplier comes into a platform in fact the brand can say that okay i want recycled polyester so and so quantity so and so kind of a quality metric where can i find it and they can get a list of such suppliers in the platform so it is a great way because the suppliers do want to work with responsible brands because then they bring a virtuous cycle to their business otherwise discussion between the brand and the supplier is very lopsided favoring the brand and through our platform we are able to elevate a supplier to almost a partnership model because the need for brand is also as high because they have to increase their percentage of sustainable products and there are so many new regulations which are coming and hitting the brands recently there was this penalty on walmart and kohl's for 5.5 million dollars because they were wrongly claiming it to be bamboo when it was actually rayon so they need to find the right supplier and have the right data at their fingertips because otherwise an ftc or european union commission is going to put a significant amount of fine on them point that you highlighted and which most consumers are not aware of is the power dynamics between the supplier and the brand and there are suppliers who sometimes lose an order for pennies on the dollar you know like just for because the brand is buying a million pieces and even if they're off by 50 cents they will shift suppliers because from the brand's point of view it that's half a million dollars in savings so i'm going to move so opening up this dialogue can make it a better environment for everybody to operate in and we see a definite shift towards that uh, uh, with their so if i look at around when we started in 2016 most of the brands will have their sustainability head to be a typically a marketing or a communication person who is communicating more trying to sort of act like a first line of defense there but now during the covid we see most of the sustainability heads they are typically coming from the production side or the buying side and on top of it in this role they are reporting into the chief compliance officer who reports into the board's risk committee so there is a major shift which has happened during the covid time because everybody can see that such kind of legislation are becoming rampant and if they're not well prepared for it it is not only about being conscious consumerism or responsible production their actual business will get affected so this is a welcome change and we've seen that change in our guests often we would accept our in our earlier episodes see coat and coat csr manager who also doubles as the marketing head but now we make a very concerted effort to get the ceos or the company heads or founders because we want to hear the authentic message and now want the person who's actually answerable to be on our show the sustainable transformation is good for them because it improves their profile as a business leader so much i will just give you my example right before trust trace i used to work in a typical corporate setup used to get happy with fancy things like okay a good laptop bag or a good air mattress that i am collecting or good hotel stay now in my business when i'm more purpose driven i have got 17 nationalities working in my company and our employee churn rate has been less than 5% in the last 4 years we have got 110 employees this was unthinkable for me in my past life so current generation or millennials forget customers you have to employ these people if your purpose is not on the right place you will not find the best talent in the market all these great excellent paying consultant jobs mckinsey bcg they are leaving their job working with purposeful startups like us why of course you have to do market benchmark salary but still they want to find that purpose in working with us so it's a good business practice to adopt sustainability i keep on repeating this to all the leaders uh, in my forbes network where i am part of i typically say that top line and bottom line 
people have been talking for the last 200 years. This century, you have to add green line to your discussion. If you don't add green line to your business, your business is not going to be future proof. So four founders started this company about five years ago? Yes, around five years back. How much does your product cost? It varies. So we charge the brands. If you are a a small brand, you pay somewhere around uh, less than $5,000. And if you are a a large brand, you pay around $50,000 per month kind of a subscription fee. And in this, we are including X number of products in that cost there. So typically when you're a small brand, you are talking about few hundred products. When you're a large brand, you're talking few thousand products in the. So when you say small brands, would they have, what would be their employee size? It can vary typically 30 to 40 employees. Like our largest customer is Adidas and Adidas, you know, has got, I don't know, maybe 60,000 plus employees or something like that. And that is the good thing with uh, Trust Trace because it's a digital platform. It can scale to very high level, but at the same level for a smaller brand, it does not cost them that much because you only pay for the usage that you, you have on the platform. As a consumer... I want to be sustainable. I want to very quickly on the shelf figure out if this product is sustainable or not. So when I buy something which is, say, made in like a handicraft, I see does it have the fair trade logo or if I'm buying organic, do I see the USDA stamp? What are you offering to your brands for their customers to very quickly say, hey, this brand is certified by Trust Trace. So we believe in the intrinsic strength of it. So we are coming from the land of Ayurveda and there. So the consumers are demanding the transparency from the brand. Most of the brands, they typically hide behind a certificate A or a claim B behind it. They will add something like supreme cotton, something like a green cotton. What does it mean? And there's a crackdown which generally is happening. In Europe, there's a significant greenwashing related crackdown happening. Every country has introduced that kind of a law there. Now, what we are enabling the brand is to say is that, hey, don't ask me for the certificate. I can give you the full journey of the product right from the source to the end product. Here are the factories who have produced it. Here is the raw materials I have used. And this kind of transparency was unheard of three years, four years back. Now, why the brand is doing it is because we have to fundamentally understand you go and talk to a brand because of the designs, because of you being trying to be associated for the brand. No brand is playing the card that my supply chain is the most cost effective efficient because cost effectiveness is seen as you're cutting corners when it is coming to ESG parameters. Why do you want to hide behind uh, this facade? You rather be transparent, build that loyalty, build that connection with your consumers. Fundamentally, we have to understand that if when you say the product is sustainable, right, it does not just stop at the production level. Now people are bothered with which brand provides me the best re-commercing opportunity. Does it have a strong recycling policy? Because they do understand that after the product is used, it should not go to the landfill. They should be able to extract and raw materials out of it and reduce their dependency on virgin fibers. So it is almost getting into a mode that it is like garment as a service. You buy a garment, you can nowadays rent also, you can lease also maybe in few years. At least you can lease nowadays. The mud jeans, they are one of our guests too. You can lease a jeans. Exactly. So when you have done that and then you return it back. Now, uh, this whole concept of infinity loop is coming into picture. So consumer is coming to you and most of the time they don't come and buy it from your shop. They are looking at your brand and your products online. They are checking your sustainability credentials and they are forming their own ideas. It is very, very necessary that they are transparent about their production process, the true cost of the product. We have a very, very good friend who runs this uh, brand called Asket in Sweden. They tell you that the total cost of my production is this. I have added so much gross margin on top of it and I'm selling it to you. Absolutely transparent when it comes to, in fact, the product cost equation also. 
That is phenomenal. But we can come to the part about cost structure transparency in a bit because most brands may hesitate to do that. I know some brands who started with saying that here is a list of our suppliers. We go to Italy to bake these shoes. And then I went a little bit further and I Googled that company and they said they had like 30 employees. And this brand was actually selling 3,000 pairs a day. That was their level of sales. So I'm like, you cannot be making these shoes. So pretty soon, they actually have gotten rid. It is a startup shoe company. They've gotten rid of that component of being like open and, you know, for you to be, go see the factory that makes my shoes. So do you think that this could fad could pretty quickly wear off? So I think uh, if I just look at the whole fashion brand list from the perspective of sustainability maturity, right? You have got sustainability role models, companies such as Patagonia, like Scandinavian brands like Houdini, Philippa K and all who are on the top, on the right corner. Then you will have sustainability challenges. So these are people who are, we have to get sustainable faster and they have made significant commitments towards it. Then you have got sustainability laggards. The trend largely is people are migrating from laggards to challenges more and more with the view that they want to reach sustainability role model or at least some closer to that side of it in the next five to six years. In that, sharing the list of your direct suppliers is the first step. It is given. If you don't do that, in fact, that's why if you go to H&M website, if you go to fast retailing website, you will typically see the list of all the suppliers, which was unheard of five years back. Now you have to also understand that when they are sharing this list of suppliers, they also expect the suppliers to start owning up their credentials or improving their credentials on sustainability there. It's a two-way street that is getting built. And I think that is where I think it's a good step that is happening because of thanks to activists like Greta Thunberg and all of them. Look at three years down the line, these are the people who will go and shop. And if you are losing them now, it's very, very bad business. And you will lose them for what? You do not want to lose them for the not sharing a list of suppliers and not being relevant to them. You mentioned Adidas. What are the, some of the other brands that you work with? So we work with Adidas. We work with Decathlon. These are the large brands we are working with. We just started working with the Italian brand called OTB, which is a bunch of uh, individual brands like Diesel and all. Where Scandinavia is our home market. So we started working with uh, them if, since 2019. We work with companies such as Fial Raven, Houdini, Philippa K, Iceberg. There's also a carpet company called Layered, which is into home textiles and carpets and all that kind of thing. We work with them. And we are very soon getting started in the U.S. We have just signed two contracts in the U.S. now. We cannot share the name now, but I think it will be visible in our website in a month's time there. In the fashion industry, we see a strong interest in plus trace coming in from outdoor sportswear kind of people typically people who are into hiking closer to outdoors kind of thing there then we see interest emerging from the luxury segment there and then comes the high street fashion or the fast fashion side the erstwhile fast fashion which is now getting rebranded as high street fashion because uh, As per the EU textile policy, fast fashion is not good fashion. So I think they're changing it to high street fashion. One of the premier brands which brought fast fashion was Zara, which is a European brand. Yeah, Inditex. So now they have moved from fast fashion to being more responsive to customer demands, to uh, regulation and naturally affecting now their profitability and their bottom line i think that they are trying to be much more relevant to their customers because i think if you look at all of the styles and everything they want to bring much more sustainable garments for a simple reason that that is what appeals not related to fast fashion but generally when we've been working with zalando which is this large online retailer the turnaround of a sustainable garment if you label a particular edit to be a sustainable edit like these are the 30 products which are sustainable compared to other products the turnover is 
five times faster than the normal product there. So sustainable products gets more eyeballs, get more people connected to it, and the throughput is higher. That's a huge shift in just two years. Exactly. It's a huge shift. And mind you, if you go and ask most of the normal buyers, if you uh, you will typically say, no, yeah, we are looking in kind of thing. And that is why I say most of the choices of fashion products happen offline. People are sitting, browsing through it. They're looking at an Instagram and etc. They go and check. They make up their mind then. And if your brand does not present the sustainability credential of the brand as well as the product well enough, you will lose those consumers there. Yes, you can still sell, but you will be only selling to value buyers and they are there with you till the time you just offer the cheap price. And that lever you cannot play after a certain extent. You want brand loyalty, you want customer loyalty, increase your percentage of sustainable products in the portfolio. The last few years have been tumultuous for everybody around the world. And now it continues to with the war. And say I'm a brand in the US, I am stuck in this quagmire of trying to get these different parts. And like you said, it comes from so many different continents. But I also have to deliver on time because once I miss the season, nobody's going to buy jackets in January or February. How do I balance it? I am pressured as a brand. It is possible that people will decide not to comply for this one year. Yes, they can. But I think it is out of question nowadays because in the US also now you are finding new laws like CBP law, which is coming into force in June, where Xinjiang cotton, things like this have been highlighted there. In fact, there have been cases where certain amount of shipments have been stuck in the port because they did not have the right documentation there. I absolutely agree. I think uh, we are living in a very, very connected world. And fashion is, I think, one of the most connected industries. You are dealing with global supply chain. Anything that happens in one corner can impact your whole, the product on the shelf kind of thing there. And that is where I think we also see that many of our customers are leveraging the traceability that the platform offers to their other advantages. While traceability, our Predominant focus has been sustainability, but the byproduct has also has been that you build significant amount of clarity about where your supply chain is. So suppose you lose out a supplier in China because of the lockdown. Can you refill it with a bring in a Turkish supplier who can supply that? So that kind of dynamic and intelligence you can see in the platform. And we believe that we are able to connect. In fact, during the COVID times, many of the brands have used our digital assessment platform to assess the suppliers without even visiting them. So they're able to run a digital assessment, say, yes, you stand good on quality and sustainability and production methods. So we will go ahead with it. It is turning out to be a good force for their own good kind of a thing, because having, it is very simple. If you know what is going on in your supply chain well enough, you can build a much, much more resilient business. We talked about small and large size brands and organizations. What about the very small, the 5 10% companies? They comprise of a, I don't know the exact numbers, but they comprise of a big portion of organizations or the companies in the U.S. Can a few of them band together and avail of your products? Like form a cooperative maybe? Yeah, so they can. But also, let's also understand, I think the value of the TrustTrace platform happens when the complexity of the supply chain is tremendously high, right? If you have got five products or suppose 10 products that you typically make or sell and you are dealing with suppose 10 direct suppliers and if the complexity can be still managed by manually. Yeah. The only place when they would like to work with trustees is suppose they don't have a bargaining power with a supplier to get all the information. Then they may form, and we have seen that happen in Europe also, like a group of four or five brands have come together and then demand that supplier, Mr. Supplier, you need to provide me this information. Because sometimes the supplier is 20 times the size of the brand. So then they say that, okay, I don't have time for it to give you the information. So then they build bargaining power by forming a collective. See, we talked about regulations and consumers. So who do you think is driving it more? Is it the consumers 
or regulations? Because we had on our show the former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, and he said, we cannot expect businesses to operate without some level of regulation. So I think consumers' interest is the leading indicator. Regulation is the lagging indicator that is happening, right? So what started as a Fridays for Future three years back got reflected because the voice was heard in UN, the voice was heard in the European Union Parliament and all that. And that has now converting because we have to understand regulations come because politicians see that there there's a strong political will for it. And political will is driven by consumers and employees generally there. So I think... Uh, consumers are the as i said are the leading indicator and that has already happened in case of sustainable products and now regulations are coming in because this is what the society needs and the brands have to react to it it is very interesting to actually see that many of the brands have been privy to this legislation being drafted now still they are getting prepared react to these legislations because you are actually moving a very very large ship which is stuck someplace right how do you navigate it out i think it's a tremendously big challenge and i think the brands who are able to make this change i think they will do tremendously well they can miss if you take athleisure as a market segment one thing is of course covid helped them because generally fashion became very very informal and people wear track suits and or whatnot into the meetings nowadays uh, but also i think they have been able to react to the need for sustainable products much faster they have been able to tell hey these are the 20 products which are sustainable i use recycled polyester and whatnot they talk about ocean plastic so uh, what was earlier considered to be garbage we are using that and converting converting it in fashion. So I think their speed has been a very, very big asset for them. So you work with suppliers in the emerging economy, but some may argue the richer economies have polluted the ground, the air. Now they are enforcing these sustainability rules on the emerging economy who want now to grow, to be competitive. Their carbon footage is so much lower than a advanced or richer economy such as america or sweden how do you justify doesn't it seem kind of unfair no i think it is a big leap forward for the suppliers because yes your footprint is smaller but at no cost you are going to lose out on the business if you are able to improve your sustainability credentials right this is a great way for them to leap forward and create a virtuous cycle which supplier would not like that they are able to charge a premium for their good production practices. And through this good production practices, they can bring in right skilled people. They can give living wages. You are changing the whole ecosystem much more towards a much more positivity. So that is a leap that most of the suppliers are doing. We actually had this concern and we were feeling very bad that when we were conceptualizing this idea that uh, won't it uh, affect the business going to India or or other Asian countries. We actually found so many Indian suppliers coming and trying to create our profile in our platform because through that they were getting access to these responsible brands mm-hmm. who believe in paying higher wages, who believe in compensating them for environmental cost or environmental certifications that they undergo. So I think it creates generally a very, very positive cycle of business. Thank you so much, Shamik, for coming on Mindful Businesses. It's been very informative and a pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure, absolutely. You're listening to Mindful Businesses, hosted and produced by Vedya Ayer. We would love to hear from you. Send us a voice note with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Subscribe, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Lafayette, Indiana. Theme music is composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Caitlin Milligan. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pasricha. This is Vidya Ayer with Mindful Businesses.